guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Megan Tennant, in case you didn't already know, and today we are talking about The 100. So we all grew up consuming stories. They surround us in our day-to-day -day lives, and no matter how many times someone says, I don't watch TV or I don't read books, I guarantee they've been exposed to enough storytelling to have certain expectations about stories. Good writers recognize those expectations and break outside of those boundaries from time to time. Great writers, on the other hand, recognize those expectations and use them to manipulate the audience's emotions. The 100 is one of the best non-comedic examples of this that I have ever found. And I'll tell you why. Now this video will have complete and utter spoilers for seasons one through four, so up through Prime Via. So if you're a little behind, you're safe. I'm not talking about season five and definitely not talking about season six because I'm in the process of watching that right now. So don't you dare spoil it in the comments. I'm only on like episode five and I'm only that far because last night we binge watched four episodes in a row. It's not like I should have been working on this video. But yeah, so in this video I'll cover an intro, three examples, and then my conclusion. So on to the topic. So when we first come into a story, the very first expectation that we have is that there's going to be a hero and that they're gonna be our POV character. Many good writers will cut holes in this box by having the main character be somewhere on the spectrum of moral grayness as we see in the 100, but very few writers will full on destroy the box by having the POV character be the actual villain. And so as the audience, we enter the story with these expectations in mind. Now from the very get go, we know that Clark is our main character and the things she does are pretty morally gray, but we always place these things on the lighter side of the gray spectrum. Likewise, the inverse is true. When we enter a show, we expect there to be villains. And when we identify the characters that we think are supposed to be those villains, we take their actions and we start putting them on the darker side of the gray spectrum. The writers of the show know this and they use this information to manipulate us. How? By showing us a situation in which the hero is fighting against a scenario, then waiting just long enough that we start to forget that, and then showing us the same type of scenario but where our hero is the perpetrator. And here are my three favorite examples of their sly writing at work. Heavy lies the crown. So when the show starts, we're immediately shown Clark imprisoned. We later find out that it's because her father discovered an imminent failure of the life support system on the Ark. People need to know. No, they'll panic. You sound like Cain. No, because he's right. I'm telling you this because you must know the truth. He wanted to disclose it and Clark wanted to help him do just that. I'm gonna help you. No. No, Clark, you're not. You're under arrest for treason. Dad? Dad? She believed that the people deserved to know, and for that, they imprisoned her for treason and to keep her quiet. Now, fast forward all the way to season four. The nuclear power plants that were destroyed by the bombs have begun to melt down. In less than six months, 96% of the Earth's surface will be uninhabitable. How do we tell these people that the world is ending after everything they've been through? We don't. Keep it to ourselves until we know what we're dealing with and how to stop it. You're afraid of how people will react? Yes. Good. Raven discovers the rapidly approaching threat of Prime Faya. And an argument breaks out on whether to tell the people. We need to tell everyone. Crowdsource it. Sound familiar? We have to let everyone on the Ark put their minds to a solution. What, and risk anarchy? But Clark and Bellamy counter her. If we tell everybody they're gonna die, the coalition is over, Rowan falls, and the grounders will be at our gate. Now remember, at this point, we're on season four. For most of us, season one is pretty cloudy at this point. So we don't immediately see the parallels here. But don't worry, because the writers will not let this slip by our notice. They wait just, just long enough for us to settle into our support of Clark's stance. And it's at this point that the writers pull back the curtain and reveal the parallel to us. On the Ark, people volunteered because they were told the truth and given a choice. A choice your dad died for. You think I've forgotten that? Okay, we'll tell everybody the truth as soon as we have a viable solution. All we have to do is patch up the ship. We're standing in our viable solution. We need a hydro generator. 
As soon as Bellamy gets back with that machine, we go public with everything and get you the help that you need. And so we think to ourselves, see, the situation is different. I'm not biased. Ah, but the writers aren't done with us yet. To further drive home the similarities of these situations in a method that you'll see repeated in the next two examples as well, they have it commented on by someone who was intimately involved with the initial scenario. Heavy lies the crown. I know the burden of keeping a secret. You think it's going to destroy your people. You locked me up. You floated my father. And now you understand why. And then we're given some time for this information to kind of settle in. For us to convince ourselves that Clark will do the right thing, that she'll tell the truth, as she promised she would. We can't just go to them with no solutions. People will panic. Spoken like the council that sent 100 kids to die on the ground. And the writers play right into this. Bellamy returns and he wasn't able to get the water uh, hydro scrubber thing. I have a degree in science, I swear. Which means the Ark will only sustain a hundred people. What am I supposed to tell the people now? The truth. But as promised, Clark calls a meeting. And she does reveal the incoming threat. And so we're thinking, see? I told you so. Clark's a good person. She didn't lie like Jaha or Kane. And then the writers, surely laughing the entire time they do it, give us this next little bit. Every single one of us will survive on this ship. I give you my word. And so our dear Clark, our main character, our hero, steps straight into Jaha's shoes, to Kane's shoes, people that we viewed as bad for doing this exact same thing. Nice speech. Your dad would be so proud. Through Clark's eyes in season one, we felt her anger. We hated Jaha and Kane for lying to them. And we rooted for Abby as she finally got the courage to steal that video and stream it over the network so everyone knew what was going on. And now, in season four. So what do I do? We make the best decisions that we can with the information that we have. Then hope that there is a forgiving God. What are you gonna do? Hope that there's a forgiving God. The character we know and love and support is standing exactly where they stood. People have a right to know that they're working for nothing. Attention, Arcadia, I have an announcement! Lock him up. Next scenario, Bone Marrow. So in season two, our villains are very clearly Dr. Tsing and Cage, and at times Dante. So they're living in Mount Weather, and Mount Weather is hundreds of years old, so it's starting to kind of break down and they're starting to get more and more radiation exposure, which they can't handle. And so Dr. Singh has this theory. Because you were raised in space, your circulatory systems developed the ability to filter radiation out of your blood. Then she theorizes and subsequently tests the theory. If treatments using their blood give us temporary immunity, how do we extend that immunity forever? By going to the source of their blood. What will it take to stay? Bone marrow? All that they have. They'll die so that we can finally live. The answer is no. And so we hit the ever so common gray area situation of a life for a life. A trolley problem, if you will. If you don't know what a trolley problem is, I did a video covering that very extensively. Card up here, link in the description down below. Don't watch it right now. Wait till the end of this video so YouTube thinks you like me, but then go watch it. But anyways, on one track we have the 47, and on the other track we have the 382. But who are we rooting for? Our heroes, of course. And yes, it really hurts to see Maya die, especially seeing Jasper's pain because he's one of our heroes, but we ultimately view the final outcome of season two as being victorious. And as such, we place the corresponding gray spectrum over the characters. We think to ourselves, no, it isn't okay to kill other people, to save oneself from a harm those other people didn't even create. Internally, and generally even subconsciously so, we justify the actions of the hero. And then the writers wait. They wait until you've started to forget. And that 
is when they flip the scenario on its head and show you the same type of scenario, but from the other point of view. So fast forward again to season four. Radiation is coming and Clark needs to figure out how to get people through that. Many leads are chased and one of them might sound a little bit familiar. We can't create night blood unless we go to space, but Luna can. Theoretically, we can inject ourselves with her bone marrow. And we become night bloods. Now the writers don't make it easy on us. We're eased into it, tricked, dare I say, manipulated. In the beginning, Luna's consenting to have her bone marrow taken. I'd like to run some tests. But it has to be tested on someone. Someone that we know is probably going to die a very, very painful death. So then we're starting to hit kind of the more dark side of the gray spectrum. Oh, but perfect timing right into our laps is dropped. Bayless, you don't know what he did to me. I'm gonna cut him for every time he cut me. I'm gonna make him beg the way I begged. Wait, what? What if his death could save us all? Of course we can kill a villain for the greater good, right? And so we justify the decision to test Nightblood on this man and we watch him die in screaming agony. And that's when we find out that Amori lied. That wasn't Bayless, was it? They're gonna sacrifice someone to test Nightblood. Who do you think that's gonna be, huh? Clark? Raven? But we still support Clark because of course, Clark didn't know that this person was innocent. And we're now pissed at Amori for lying and letting this innocent man die. Looks like we know who's next. And so we accept the state of things because now we feel like maybe she kind of deserves it. Again, easing back towards the dark side of the gray spectrum a little bit. But Luna, on the other hand, does not agree. No, I won't allow my blood to kill any more innocent people. And here's where things take a turn from the darker gray to the very dark gray. Rowan fights Luna, knocks her out, and puts her onto the table. And at this stage, we're still secretly kind of happy about this outcome because we want the characters we know and love to live. And besides, it's just a little bone marrow, right? And it's Raven who takes a hammer to our tinted glass, revealing the true colors of the situation at hand in a way that we can no longer deny. So you're gonna strap her down and take her bone marrow? Welcome to Mount Weather. A blow that hits even harder coming from Raven. Because we watched Raven strapped down in Mount Weather. We watched them take her bone marrow. And through the entire experience, we screamed a battle cry. We demanded vengeance. And yet, we aren't screaming now. Why? And that why echoes around in our heads. And we start to ask ourselves, What's different? Sure, she's unconscious and it's less bloody. This situation is generally portrayed in a less dark light, but at its core, we're taking bone marrow from someone who is not consenting to have it taken. First we survive, then we find our humanity again. I'm sure they said the same thing in my mother too. And maybe we try to hide behind the excuse that Luna doesn't have to die, right? Well, I've got bad news for you if you were still holding on to that excuse. There's 382 of us. That's roughly eight procedures for each of the kids. Every one of the 47 would die. Based on that math, killing Luna would save 8.12 people. Let's be generous. Let's say she has enough marrow to save nine. Well, we already lost one whole sample worth on the guy they tested. Not only would they need to kill Luna, but to save what? eight people? Even if they had an infinite supply of nightbloods, which we know very well that they don't. If nightblood is so rare, then why do you let them kill each other? For Skycrew alone to save all of their people, they would need to kill about 50 nightbloods, making them officially worse than Mount Weather. Okay, but maybe you're thinking, what if they needed less marrow for this? In which case, I've got more bad news for you. Here's a side-by-side -side of the marrow injected into Dante and the marrow injected into the test subject to make him a nightblood. So that theory kind of dies right there. No, the difference in the situations is clear. In the first scenario, we wanted the characters we know and love to survive. In the second scenario, we want the characters we know and love to survive. 
all of the justifications that we built up in the first scenario are melted away, leaving us raw, exposed, reeling. And these, these are the moments in which the story burrows into our minds, forcing us to look inwards in ways that only great stories truly can. Ah, but they aren't done yet. Example number three, the calling. In season one, one of the very, very first people cast in the light of the villain is Cain. And if you haven't seen season one in a while, you might be thinking, no, Cain isn't bad. He's a great character, just like everyone else. And it's true, he very quickly redeems himself even before the end of season one. But he does start out cast much more on the dark side than the light. Now you all think I'm the bad guy, but I'm the only one who's willing to do what it takes to save us. And if I have to take us down to a cosmic Adam and Eve, I will do it. So season one, the Ark is dying. Citizens are reporting pulmonary toxicity. Children are going blind. And then Jaha reveals, The council approved Kane's population reduction plan three hours ago. 320 people will be excised from the grid. No murdered, Thelonious. 320 people will be murdered. Now most of the audience views the lengths to which Kane will go to ensure that this culling happens, and we hate him for it. Even though, given what he knows, that's kind of the last possible resort at that time. So why do we view his actions as evil? Well, because Clark views his actions as evil. They're getting ready to kill 300 people up there. But here's the thing. This isn't the last time we see a culling. Season four. They've given up on the Nightblood and now they're fighting over a bunker with limited space where anyone left outside of it will die. And now it's our beloved Octavia who has the final say. Sky Crew gets a hundred beds, same as everybody else. And it's our beloved heroine, our main character, Clark, who is the one who composed the list that will decide who lives and who dies, and who's standing by and just letting this happen. I can't believe we are talking about sending 364 of our own people to their death. No murdered, Thelonious. 320 people will be murdered. Then let's fight this. We're lucky they're giving us any space in this bunker at all. Look, someone still needs to get Raven. I'd like to volunteer. And I'll join you. Now this situation does more closely mirror the first one because Cain is still present and he has largely redeemed himself. This scene is given so much emotional weight by the way Cain breaks under the pressure of once again facing this impossible decision. Despite all of the growth, he does still believe that the calling was the best decision given the information he had at the time. And now we as the audience have also grown to see it as the only possible choice given the information we have at the time. But we've only been able to reach this point because we're now seeing the situation through the eyes of Octavia and Clark, who we know and love. So whereas the bone marrow scenario takes our heroes and casts them in a darker light by showing us what they're truly capable of, this scenario takes the situation and casts it on the lighter side of the spectrum by letting us see it through the eyes of our heroes. And if you're arguing that on the arc, Kane tried to act much more preemptively and that's what made it bad, remember that waiting those 10 days up to the number that they needed to cull from 260 to 320. Nobody wants to do this, but the inescapable fact is that for every day we delay, 10 more people will need to be sacrificed. You have 10 days. And so we come to my conclusion. Manipulation is defined as to control or influence a person or situation unfairly, cleverly, or unscrupulous. Unscru unscrupulously. And I argue that the writers of the 100 cleverly influenced us using our pre-programmed bias towards our main characters. The writers let us take a stance on a difficult problem and then they flip that situation upside down, driving us straight into a sea of emotions where we have no ground to stand on. The manipulation lies in the carefully calculated, delayed reveal of the parallels and in the slow build from an acceptably similar scenario to a full-on mirror. 
In the absence of a parallel, we would gladly take the hero's side and never once question our stance. By pointing out the stance we took in the past, we can no longer blindly support the hero. Not without admitting that on some level, our support of that character is unfairly rooted in their role itself. To stay true to what we thought we believed in the first situation, we have to place our character on the darker side of the moral gray spectrum in the second situation. And if we want to truly support our hero through the second scenario, we have to accept our own moral grayness, our own flaws as viewers and even as human beings. And that was it for this video. Comment down below without spoiling it for me. Have you seen season six yet? How do you feel it measures up to the past seasons? Again, if you want to know what the hell a trolley problem is, link up here and in the description down below, go check it out. If you like morally gray characters, then check out Aletheia. It is a new adult post-apocalyptic book. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Say you